Our second reading this evening is taken from Psalm 69. I will read through to verse 21, and our text uh, is taken from verses 16 through to 21. Psalm 69, verses 1 through to 21. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gates speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me. In, thy tru- in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul, and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach, and my shame, and my dishonour. Mine adversaries are all before me. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Amen. We'll leave the reading of God's word there this evening. We see in this psalm uh, the reality of suffering. The reality of suffering. It's, it's true that we live in a world that if we look around us, uh, we note this, that it, it's a world uh, that's full of suffering. Uh, sin has really ruined the world and as a consequence, uh, the suffering is widespread. We see it certainly if we uh, watch the news or read the newspapers there's, there's wars across the world, there's, there's famines, there's natural disasters and many afflicting events that are going on that bring wreck and ruin. On top of that, there's, there's animosity and enmity uh, between people. There's, there's reproach being thrown left, right and centre. It's a world that's full of suffering because of the, the brokenness uh, due to the, the sin in the world. <clears throat> 
But suffering is not only uh, something that is out there. It's something that is uh, also in the church. It's not just the ungodly uh, that suffer, but it is the saints that suffer. And we hardly need to be reminded of this. We all experience uh, this reality to a greater or lesser extent uh, at different times in our lives. One of the prominent reasons for the suffering that is particular to the saints is from the reproach of the world. As part of the consequence of the fall uh, and of the salvation uh, of, of a people out of the, out of the fallen sinful humanity by Christ is that there is enmity now between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman as we read of in Genesis chapter 3. So there's enmity uh, as a consequence of a people being saved out of the world. There is, a, there is war going on between the seed of the serpent and, and the seed of the woman. This enmity uh, manifests itself in the reproach of the world against the saints. And this is, or can be at times, a disheartening reality. Uh, the many afflictions of life that press in upon us, uh, coupled with this reproach of the world, it can be hard to bear up under. And adding to that problem, we have a tendency to become overly introspective. Uh, in, the, in the suffering of these afflictions and the reproach of the world, uh, we can tend to, to look inward and be uh, hyper-focused on ourselves in our suffering. And this only compounds the problem and, and makes things seem all too difficult. Now, the scriptures give us a, a, a remedy uh, to this problem of being overly introspective uh, in light of the reproaches that we suffer as saints in this, in this fallen world. And the answer is... Uh, to look to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as the reproached one. The answer is to look away from ourselves, as difficult as that is, uh, and to look to him. Uh, this psalm prompts us to do just that. Uh, this psalm is a detailed description of Christ's suffering. Uh, not your suffering, not my suffering, uh, but his suffering. Uh, through his reproach. This psalm leads us and encourages us to take our eyes off of ourselves, to, to look outward and to fix our eyes upon the reproached one, upon Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And we'll see that this is a great benefit to the saints to do this. By gazing upon Christ in his suffering, uh, we see that we are not alone in our suffering, but we have one that has gone before us in this way. By fixing our gaze upon him, we see that we can rest on him as one who by his suffering uh, has made atonement for our sins, has purchased for us an everlasting redemption. We can see as we fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ that we can be at peace uh, that through his suffering, and this is a remarkable thing, through his suffering, uh, he has sanctified uh, the suffering of the saints also. He's, he's set aside the sufferings of the saints for holy and good ends. This is all due to the, the suffering of uh, Christ as the reproached one. By noticing... Uh, the Messiah here is the reproached one in this psalm as well. We can, we can benefit because we have here before us uh, the, the reality that uh, prayer or crying out to God in suffering is of great help. It is something that is, is necessary uh, to do in our suffering as well. And we can appreciate in this, as we take note of, of the Messiah here and his cries, uh, the goodness of God as the one who is the only one that is able to aid uh, the sufferer. So there's great benefit in, in, for a moment here, taking our eyes off of ourselves and fixing our eyes on Christ as the reproached one. 
And that's what we take up for consideration this evening, the suffering and cries of the reproached one, the Messiah. The first thing we want to look at briefly uh, to lay a foundation is the reality that this is a, a messianic psalm. And then secondly, we'll focus in on that reproach that Christ suffered and the cries uh, that he made to the Lord in that suffering. And then finally, we'll touch on uh, the significance that this has for us as God's people. So first then, we'll look at this, uh, the fact that this is uh, a messianic psalm. There are many uh, psalms in the, uh, in the scriptures that are uh, experiential in character. That is, they detail uh, in a very uh, comprehensive way the experience of the saints as they walk this pilgrim pathway to glory. They are experiential in character. They are uh, examples laid down for us um, of, of what it will be like to live the life of a Christian. And for this reason, the Psalms are, uh, are precious to the saints. They teach us what we'll experience, both the afflicting experiences and the uplifting. They teach us how we are to live godly and sanctified lives in and through those experiences. And they teach us repeatedly how the Lord is ever faithful uh, to aid and uphold and deliver the saints through those experiences. So that, that's a category of psalm uh, that we have, those, those ones that are experiential in character. But some psalms are messianic in character. And that, in that they speak of the Messiah explicitly, about Christ himself. They speak about his glorious person. They speak about uh, the wondrous offices that he uh, undertook and was ordained into as the redeemer of God's elect, the prophet, priest and king of his people. And they speak about all of the redemptive work that the, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is doing in those offices. These Psalms are wholly messianic. And, and we see in this that they are used and to be used to give further light uh, to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of, of God in the New Testament. We don't separate uh, the old from the new uh, in any way, uh, particularly in this way, in, in how that it sheds light on uh, Christ and his work. The Old Testament, uh, particularly in these Psalms and in many other places, sheds light on the person and the work of Jesus Christ, just as the new uh, sheds light on, on the old. So this is one such psalm. This is a psalm that is messianic. It's a psalm in which Christ the sufferer is placed before our eyes. It's a psalm that sets Christ up as the surety in the covenant of redemption, in that he's coming into the world and doing all and experiencing all in the place of and for his people. Uh, proof of this and, and demonstration of this to help us understand this is the New Testament's use of this psalm in particular. In John 15 verse 25, we see there that verse 4 is quoted to describe Jesus' uh, un the unfounded hatred of, of Jesus Christ. There we would read, uh, they hated me without a cause. That's from verse 4 of this psalm. In John 2 verse 17 uh, we see verse 9 of this psalm quoted to describe Jesus' cleansing of the temple. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, it says, uh, referencing Christ as he came in and drove out uh, those people from the temple. In Romans 15 verse 3, we see uh, verse 9 quoted uh, to, to show or demonstrate Christ's voluntary humility and service to his people. There we see that the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell upon me. In Matthew 27, verse 34 and 48, Mark 15, John 19, uh, we see uh, verse 21 uh, used, which is part of our text, when Christ is on the cross 
crucified and they give him gall and vinegar to drink. Uh, this, in a similar fashion, is, is in Romans 11, verse 9, which quotes verses 22 and 23. The New Testament's use of this psalm, this repeated use, uh, points us towards this reality that uh, this is a messianic psalm. If it wasn't for those, if it weren't for those uh, repeated uses of this psalm in the New Testament, we may be inclined to think that this is just this is one of those psalms in which David's experience uh, is given for the experience of the saints, or, or pointing to the normative experience of the saints. The use of this psalm in the New Testament demonstrates. Uh, from the beginning to the end of this psalm, that this is a psalm wholly and entirely about uh, the Messiah and prophesies much of, of, of what the Messiah will undergo as the suffering servant. <clears throat> so it's all about Christ. This is a psalm that is all about Christ and it's a messianic psalm. So our attention in this psalm is, is directed off of ourselves and directed onto Christ as the reproached one. And we take this opportunity then to look away from ourselves and our own reproaches and to set our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And we see him in all of his reproach and in the cries that he makes to the Lord. So it's a messianic psalm. <clears throat> We'll look now at these reproaches and the cries of the Messiah in particular. Uh, the text describes the, re the reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was reproached uh, by his many enemies. We read in verse 19, Thou hast known my reproach, my shame and my dishonour. And then in verse 20, Reproach hath broken my heart. This reproach is the, the scorn, the taunting, the disgrace, uh, the shame that was heaped upon uh, the Messiah by his enemies. Uh, the Messiah was a reproached one. He was not one who skated through life uh, happily without causing any stirs, without having any trouble, without ever offending anyone. He was a reproached man. He was reproached by his many enemies. This is seen in verse 18 when he says, deliver me because of my enemies. And then if we look back to verse 4, we see they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head of mine head, that they would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. The Lord Jesus Christ had many enemies, many men that hated him, Many men that reviled him. And it's important that we understand that this is not due to any uh, defect in the character of the Messiah. It wasn't because of any abrasiveness uh, in him. He is the, the spotless son of God. There was nothing in him uh, to cause uh, this reproach. This was an unjust reproach. And we see that this is uh, because... Uh, he came into the world uh, to save sinners. And he came into the world to save sinners from the, the, the grip and the bondage of Satan. He came into the world to destroy Satan uh, and his anti-Christian kingdom. Therefore, Satan raged against the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the children of Satan, all those who are in bondage to him and his servants, raged against the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated him and they reproached him. This reproach uh, from Christ's enemies uh, is the cause of his suffering here in our text. And it's the, it's the cause that moves him, as we'll see, to cry out to the Lord. This reproach had a profound impact upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he suffered from a broken heart. He says, reproach hath broken my heart. A broken heart describes the violent anguish of the mind and, and the soul 
due to the reproach of these enemies. This is no weak emotion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Such was the the wickedness and the extent of the reproach of his enemies that the Messiah was cast into a state of violent anguish of mind and of heart. Reproach hath broken his heart. This reproach caused him to cry out that I am full of heaviness. Literally, I am sick. My body is racked by hurt. The great burden of reproach upon his soul uh, is so great that it extends into the physical realm. Such was the Messiah's uh, suffering under this reproach that his very body was tormented. As it was said of him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated great drops of blood. Uh, The mental anguish uh, came forth into the physical realm and his body was racked uh, by Uh, pain and torment he suffered also uh, the complete desertion of his friends he said I looked for some to take pity but there was none and for comforters but I found none the reproach soul uh, looks for and longs for uh, the pity and the comfort of friends the pity and the comfort of friends is something that is uh, desperately sought after in, t- in such times of reproach. And Christ had none. Uh, Christ was deserted of all men. Certainly he was deserted by his enemies who actively reproached him and tormented him and tortured him. But he was really deserted by his own, by his own beloved disciples. He was betrayed by one of them, Judas, He was denied three times by another, Peter, and he was forsaken by all of them as they fled away from him in fear uh, for themselves. He was deserted uh, of all of his friends and when in a time that he desperately needed the pity and the comfort of friends, uh, they deserted him in his time of greatest need. And this was a sore reproach upon the Messiah. But he suffered also from physical abuse. Uh, the, the text goes on and says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This obviously is a, is a prophecy of Christ on the cross as he was uh, thirsting, uh, as the anguish of that violent death upon the cross was draining him, and he cried out for a drink. And instead of, the, instead of compassion for someone who was in such uh, a state, uh, they gave him a gall, which is a, a bitter herb and, and vinegar. They tormented him physically. When he was in distress, they gave him exactly what he, uh, what he didn't need. He needed comfort and pity and he received the exact opposite. And this is like a, a slap in the face uh, to the reproached one. So he suffered in all of these ways, in all of these reproaches. And we have to understand that this reproach that the Lord suffered was uh, no mere theatre. This suffering that he he felt, this reproach that he felt and that caused him to have a a broken heart was, was real suffering. The enemies of Christ uh, reproached him all of his life. But this was especially true in those last days of his life uh, as he was betrayed by his disciple, as he was put on trial, as he was falsely accused, as he was tormented and tortured, as he was slandered, as he was falsely accused, uh, ridiculed and eventually uh, sent to the cursed death of the cross. The effects of this reproach in the suffering of Christ were real. Christ was not merely putting on a show for the cameras. Our Lord felt all of the grievous emotional, psychological and physical trauma related to this suffering. This is the the stark reality. Christ, the eternal Son of God in his human nature, suffered really and grievously under the wicked reproach of his enemies. 
and so he cries out uh, to the Lord. This is what we have to focus our attention on this evening, off of ourselves and, and to gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ here as, as the reproached one. As it is, as it is recorded in, in, in John chapter 3, this is a Christ that is lifted up in the wilderness so that all men might see. This is Christ lifted up in his suffering as the one who came uh, to suffer that he might make atonement for sin. And this is the one uh, upon whom we look and we live. This is the purpose of, of, of the words of God, the word of God here in this psalm, to set Christ as the reproached one before our eyes so that we might look uh, to him and to live. But these reproaches, as, as I said, they, they caused the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to cry out to the Lord in his deep anguish as the burden of the, of the reproach of his enemies pressed upon him and, and caused him uh, to, be, to be broken in his heart and tormented in his mind, as we've said, he cries out to the Lord. And in our text, he makes six uh, cries, six individual uh, cries to the Lord. In verse 16, he, he says, Hear me, O Lord. Now hear as in answer or, or give me that which I stand in need of. Uh, the Messiah, as he suffered the wicked reproaches of men, stood in great need. And therefore his cry is to the Lord that the Lord would supply him in his need, supply all that he stood in need of. And then he cries out, turn unto me, turn as in have respect to me, look to me, regard me. To look away from someone is to disregard them, to reject them, and to turn your back upon someone. So to turn to is to accept and embrace and, and, and to experience uh, the favourable disposition uh, of God again. The Messiah in his torment experienced uh, the disregard, the experiential abandonment of God in his suffering. Hence the cry that he made from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he cries out to, to the Lord, turn unto me. And then he follows on in a, in a similar way and, and says, hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble, in verse 17. To have the face of the Lord hidden uh, is to feel the desertion of God. It's to experience a uh, complete lack of, of peace and of comfort uh, in that moment. This is, this is a restatement or a, or a pressing further of what has just been said in turn unto me. To have the face of God revealed is to experience uh, the smiles of God, to experience the comfort of God in all of his beauty and all of his glory. And this is the, the meaning that is repeated time and time again in the Psalms by that reference, the light of God's countenance. It's a, it's a glorious uh, concept to consider. When the light of God's countenance shines upon a soul, there is joy, there is happiness, there is, there is peace, there is hope, there's comfort. Christ in his time of reproach had no joy, had no peace, had no comfort, he was the reproached one. It's as though God had hidden his face from him, had turned his back on him. So he cries out to the Lord, hide not thy face from thy servant. And then he, in verse 17, he, he cries out again, hear me speedily. That is, answer me or, or give me what I stand in need of with urgency. The Messiah cries out, as it were, give me what I stand in need of soon or I perish. It is an urgent cry for present help. There is no time for delay. The waves of suffering and reproach threaten to, to drown his soul. And then he cries out, draw near unto me and redeem my soul. Draw near like a friend draws near to an afflicted brother or like a father to a hurting son. Deliver me, he then goes on to say, deliver me from mine enemies. And as we've seen, Christ had many enemies and the hatred of these enemies was fierce. The reproach was great. 
So we have here six urgent cries that, that the Messiah makes out, makes to the Lord in his suffering. These were urgent cries. These are cries which, which teach us just how deep uh, his suffering was, how grievous uh, these reproaches were. These cries could only come from a place of utter abandonment, of unimaginable torment and of devastating suffering. And these cries we see were made to the Lord. They were made to the Lord. They were made to the Lord as the knowing one. We see in verse 19, uh, thou hast known my reproach. The cry of the Messiah, of the Messiah is, is founded upon the Lord as the knowing one. It's certainly true that the Lord knows all things uh, because of his attribute of omniscience, of all knowing. He has all of the data before his eyes in, in his ever-present uh, existence. But this knowing uh, goes further than that. Uh, this is the knowing of, of personal and intimate uh, knowledge. This is not simply the knowing of, of having all of the data together before your mind. This is the, the knowing of, of love and of sympathy. The Lord knows the Messiah's reproach and he knows his suffering and he knows his reproach and suffering uh, from a heart of love and compassion. On the basis of, of this being the knowing Lord, the one who knows uh, the reproach and the suffering of the Messiah, the cry goes out to the Lord. But the Lord is also the good one. The Lord is the good one. The Lord's goodness here in, our, in this psalm is expressed in his loving kindness. Hear me, O Lord, we read in verse 16. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. This loving kindness is what we would, what we would call mercy. It's the disposition in God uh, that delights to condescend to help the pitiful, the wretched, the afflicted, the reproached. It's a disposition in God that delights to condescend, uh, to help, to stoop down and aid the pitiful and the wretched, uh, the afflicted and the reproached. This is the loving kindness of God. It's an aspect of God's goodness. God has a heart of loving kindness uh, for the pitiful because God is good. God is essentially good. The Messiah cries out to the Lord to answer him and to give him what he stands in need of on the basis of this loving kindness, on the basis of God being the good God who delights to condescend down uh, to help and to aid the pitiful and the wretched. And oh, how the Messiah uh, stood in need of this, how he stood in need of this loving kindness at this time. He was of all men most wretched. He was most pitiful. He was most afflicted. He was most reproached. The Lord's goodness is also expressed in his tender mercies. Turn unto me, the Lord, uh, the Messiah cries, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. These tender mercies here are uh, the compassion of God. This is the, the fuel uh, for his loving kindness. The Lord holds the Messiah to be very dear. He holds him, as it were, in his bosom. Uh, the root meaning of this, of this word is, is womb. It's the most tender and protected and, and, and uh, uh, loved part of, of the body. It's the tenderness, the compassion. So the Messiah cries out to the Lord to turn to him on the basis of these tender mercies, on the basis of the deep and abiding compassion that the Father has for his beloved Son. <clears throat> 
So this is, this is the, the Lord uh, who the Messiah cries out to, the one who is, is all-knowing, the one who, who draws near in, in knowledge, this, this, this love and this intimacy in the suffering and, and reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord who is, is good, who is essentially good, who is full of uh, loving kindness, full of mercy to the afflicted, full of um, power to help uh, the afflicted, full of uh, tender mercies, uh, compassion, uh, which fuels the loving kindness of God. And this is the, the basis of this cry to the Lord. It's because of who the Lord is as the good God of of loving kindness and multitude uh, tender mercies. And these cries of the Messiah are the responses to his great suffering. The cries that come up to the Lord flow out of uh, his great suffering. The suffering of the Messiah, as we have said, was real and it was grievous. And the real suffering of the Messiah drove him out of necessity uh, to cry out to the Lord in his need. These cries were urgent and they were, they were flowing out of uh, the anguish that was caused by the reproaches of men. These cries are also an expression of complete dependence and trust uh, upon the Lord. Uh, it's, it's certainly true that there is none other like the Lord. There is, there is no one else uh, who is all-knowing uh, like the Lord. There is no one else who is full of goodness, who is essentially good, who is the God of loving kindness, who is the God of uh, abundant, tender mercies like this God. So he is the God who is to be trusted, who is to be, to be depended upon. So the Messiah cries out to him as an expression of complete dependence and trust because he knows that this God, the Lord, is the only one that is able to aid him because he knows that he is the only one who is able to hear him, who is able to turn to him and to draw near to him and to deliver him. It's because the Lord is the knowing one because he is the good one, full of loving kindness and tender mercies, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, casts himself upon him in, in complete dependence and trust. That is the, the reproach and the cries of the Messiah. The reproach and the cries of the Messiah. That is what we have set before us this evening for us to 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 focus on as we look away from ourselves, as we look away from our own reproaches, our own suffering, and we see here before us uh, the reproached one, the reproached one who cries out to the Lord, who is a good Lord, who is essentially good, who is full of loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, what significance does this have for us as the saints? as God's people, as those who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, as those who are uh, trusting in Jesus as the Saviour, as those who have been united to him by faith. What does this mean for us? What's the significance of this suffering and these cries? The suffering of Christ was for the redemption of sinners. We can't miss this point. This wasn't any arbitrary suffering. Christ suffered here for the redemption of sinners. This suffering from the reproach of his enemies was, was part of uh, his redemptive suffering. He suffered his whole life long, all the way to the cross. And at that cross, he suffered the ultimate reproach, and that was of the Father himself as he bore the eternal wrath of God in the place of sinners. This suffering is the very thing that purchased for his people eternal redemption. So it's of utmost importance for us. It's, it's the most significant thing that this was a redeeming suffering. As we read of the suffering of our Messiah that he experienced, 
which was caused by the wickedness of men, the reproach of men. And as we hear the cries of the Lord in this psalm, we have to remember this. We have to focus our attention on this, that this is the very suffering that purchased eternal salvation. This is the very suffering that purchased salvation which is poured out upon us by the Holy Spirit. This is no meaningless suffering. This is not like any suffering that we would suffer. This is suffering which purchases salvation. It's suffering that was for us as wretched and needy sinners. This is the very price that Christ paid for your life as a believer. Christ suffered in this way the reproaches of wicked men for you. He suffered these for you and he suffered for me and for all those who would believe upon his name. That is the the primary significance of the, the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's also significant because this suffering as part of that redemption that he purchased was a suffering that sanctified the suffering of the saints. Uh, to suffer, uh, to, to sanctify means to set aside for holy use. Christ in his suffering sanctified the suffering of the saints. He suffered that our suffering might be used of God for holy ends. What are these holy ends or uses? They are numerous. But the primary one is to press us into dependence upon the Lord, just as the Messiah here in our text was was driven by this suffering to cry out to God. Uh, So also for us, uh, this suffering draws us in, shepherds us in and and pulls us in uh, to dependence upon the Lord. One thing that is universally true of the saints in this life is that when we have no suffering in those times of our life where there is no suffering, no reproach, there is very often little dependence upon God in this way that we see the Messiah dependent on God in our text. The suffering of the saints is set aside to holy use in that it is the instrument that the Lord uses in his wisdom, in his infinite wisdom, to press us in against uh, the Lord God in dependence and trust upon him. It's what brings us uh, as saints to cry out to him in the same way that the Messiah cried out. Hear me, O Lord, turn unto me, hide not thy face from me, draw near unto my soul, deliver me uh, from my enemies. In bringing us to make these cries, uh, the Lord, in his wisdom, answers them just as he answered the Messiah. This is the, the method that the Lord uses. When we cry out to him, when we, we're drawn in and pressed in against the Lord to cry out to him, uh, to hear us, God hears us. When we cry out for the Lord to turn unto us, he turns unto us. When we cry out to him that he hide not his face from us, Uh, He reveals his face to us. The glorious light of his countenance uh, shines upon us. When we cry out to him to draw near to our soul and comfort us and uphold us, he draws near to our soul. When we cry out to him for deliverance, uh, he delivers us. Suffering leads us to cry out to the Lord in this way. And the Lord in turn lavishes upon us the crying out saint, uh, all of his goodness, all of his uh, tender, loving kindness, he pours it out upon the saints. So because Christ suffered the reproach of men and suffered in that reproach, our reproaches and suffering are never purposeless. They are sanctified uh, for holy use. So this is significant because it is the suffering of, Uh, that has procured eternal redemption for God's people and it's significant uh, because uh, it sanctifies, it sets apart uh, the saints' own suffering for for holy ends. But the saints are also uh, called to follow Christ in his suffering here as our pattern. 
The saints uh, follow Christ in suffering. We don't reduce uh, Christ to merely a pattern to follow. This is a, an error which pervades uh, much of the church today where they overlook almost entirely the redemptive efficacy of Christ's suffering. That is, that is primary, the redemptive efficacy of Christ's suffering. But we don't, and we don't diminish Christ's work uh, in that way in reducing it merely to a pattern, but we don't, or we can't miss the fact that Christ is a pattern for us to follow. Uh, this, is, this is by virtue of or on account of the union that we have with Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that in scriptures we are, we are told that we, are, uh, we died with Christ, uh, that we rise with Christ and that we are glorified with Christ. This is the reality of our union with Jesus Christ. We share in and partake of all that Christ did. Christ has gone before us in every way. He is the forerunner in every way, especially in his suffering and in his reproach. Uh, we as, as saints are not forging a new path. We're not charging into uncharted territory in our suffering and reproach. We are but following Christ. We know that Christ commanded us to take up our cross and to follow him. This means that as those who are united to him by faith, we bear the reproaches that he bore and the cross that he carried. And, and it's important for us to see at this point as well as we're speaking about this following Christ, that his suffering was of, a, was of an entirely distinct character. His suffering, as we've said, was redemptive. Our suffering is not redemptive. It is used by God for holy ends, as we've seen, but not in any way uh, purchasing what Christ purchased perfectly for us. Yet we follow him in this as we are united to Christ by faith, as he is the head and we are the body. Where the head goes, the body goes. As Christ walked the path of reproach and suffering on his way to glory, so also we who are united to him by faith walk the same path. And we see in this that we have to... Uh, at times alter our expectations of what this life uh, is, what this life will look like on the pilgrim's pathway to heaven. Uh, you will suffer reproach uh, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are united to him by faith. If you are standing for Christ boldly, if you are confessing his name before men, if you are living for him, then you will suffer as he suffered the reproach of the world. But we can be comforted in this that we are, we are not treading new ground as we've seen. Christ has gone before us and as Christ walked that pathway to glory, so also we walk that pathway to glory. And we can be comforted that all of the afflictions, the reproach of the world is sanctified and set apart for holy ends uh, for God's people. So the saints follow Christ in his reproach uh, on account of the union that we have with him. But the saints are also to follow Christ in his cries. Christ here as the Messiah uh, gives us a pattern for our prayer in our reproach. As the Messiah cried out to the Lord in his suffering, cried out uh, to Jehovah who is good and who is full of Loving kindness and tender mercy, so also do we. We follow Christ in his cries. We cry out to God, hear me, turn unto me, hide not your face from me, hear me speedily, draw near to my soul, deliver me. This is a pattern that we must follow. It's a pattern that we can follow. That's the joy of it. We can pray to God as a reconciled father in our, in our afflictions as we are reproached. Christ prayed to his father. We pray to our father in Christ as our redeemer. Christ prayed to his father who is his father by nature. We pray to our father as he is our father by adoption as we are in Christ and incorporated into the family of God. The father hears, heard, Christ's urgent cry. The Father will hear 
your urgent cry as you are in Christ. The Father is good to Christ. The Father is good to us as we are in Christ. The Lord is full of loving kindness to Christ, so he is to us as we are in Christ. As the Father is full of tender kindness or tender mercies to Christ, so he is to us as we are in Christ. That is the glory of being able to follow the Messiah in his reproach and in his cries. <clears throat> so we see that this is it's not about us. It's not about us and our reproach and our affliction, but it's about Christ as the Messiah, his reproach that he suffered at the hands of wicked men. And it's about his urgent cries that he made to the Lord. And we see in this that though it's about Christ, uh, it's of great benefit to us as saints. Amen. Let's ask.